Hi, everyone. My name is Jean Arturi. I'm the manager of the Weston Art and Innovation Center, and I'd like to welcome you to the first event in our speaker series, Through the Lens of Art, Building Bridges. I have a little bit of housekeeping before we dive in. The event is being recorded. Feel free to turn your video off if you'd rather not be seen. Please mute yourself so that we can all focus on our speakers. We welcome questions, but please hold off for now. I'll open up the chat box after UN's presentation so that you can post questions there. The idea for the series came about last summer when Audrey Pepper, one of our advisory board members and my partner in this, and I were trying to find the right words to describe the feelings of anger and horror we were feeling over the death of George Floyd. We spoke about the art, the public art, that was being created in reaction, not only to George Floyd, but centuries worth of social injustices. Sharing and discussing the art broadened our perspectives and deepened our compassion and empathy. We are grateful for the artists who take on the immense responsibility of sharing the stories of those in marginalized communities. We want to learn more about their perspective as creators. As audience members, we wanna understand the role institutions play to ensure that they are doing their part to represent and be accessible to all. Finally, we wanna hear from the collector's perspective what role do they play in this trio? How can they support the artists and the institutions that are trying to tell the stories of those whose voices aren't being heard? And so here we are, through the lens of art building bridges. I would especially like to thank the Weston Cultural Council and the Friends of the Weston Public Library for their support in this series. Our facilitator is Linda Bond. For over two decades, Linda's artwork has addressed issues of social concern. It primarily explores the experience of global conflict and more recently, the chaos and confusion here in the United States. Her work will be included in the forthcoming publications, Emergence, The Role of Mindfulness and Creativity, and Loaded, Guns in Contemporary Art. A 20 year retrospective exhibition of Linda's work at Drexel University, Errors and Omissions, is scheduled for September, and her site specific installation for the Eastern State Penitentiary Historic Site in Philadelphia will be installed in May. The first speaker in our series is internationally known interdisciplinary artist Yu Wen Wu. Yu Wen Wu was born in Taipei. She now works and lives in Boston. Her experience as an immigrant has informed and shaped her art as she focuses her attention on displacement, immigration, and assimilation. Her wide range of projects include large-scale drawings, site-specific video installations, community-engaged practices, and public art. Recent work includes Lantern Stories, an outdoor public artwork commissioned by the Greenway Conservancy for Chin Park in Chinatown as well as Leavings Belongings, which is currently at Site Santa Fe. UN is also a 2020 cohort in Boston's Now and Then, Now and There Accelerator Program. Welcome, UN Wu and Linda. So let me, let me do a screen share now. <laughs> okay. Can you all see that? Yeah, okay. Um, so I believe that art has the capacity to take on large issues and inspire change. Art is a lens, it's a mirror that reflects the culture and the times. We as artists absorb what's happening around us and to us, and at times with events that are deeply personal but that often also represents a larger collective. Our backgrounds, experiences, um, and our beliefs help shape our decisions regarding the projects we take on and the messages we choose to amplify. And by our individual and collective work, art can build bridges. Okay, why is this not? Um, I'm interested in intersections 
and interconnections. Um, many of the work I pursue lie at the crossroads of art, science, politics, cultural issues, and the natural world. Through my work, I address lifelong interests and questions that resonate for me. Movement, migration, immigration, displacement is part of a personal history. And specifically the conversations around assimilation, cultural identity in a new country, and the position in the society of being Asian American are all part of my experiences and my inquiries. As an interdisciplinary visual artist, my language of expression is through many channels, large scale installations, public art, community engaged projects, as well as in the studio through drawing, works on paper, exploring materials and objects in context to issues that I'm thinking about. The studio and the public artworks inform each other, but it does offer different spaces for the work to exist. Given our time today, I won't cover my studio artwork, but just dive into the large scale installations and public art. Um, the components of these work include video, sculpture, photography, and community engaged works. And, um, and the, although I have completed many works on, con and con on concepts around displacement, um, today I'll just share four recent uh, projects, particularly Lantern Stories and the Durational Project Leavings Belongings. These are the works in which stories of migration, of departure, of memories brought to a new place, of the challenges of belonging, uh, all are essential elements of much of my work. I like to uh, briefly begin with crossings. This is a site specific work in 2016 at the Perlman Teaching Museum at Carleton College. I have been working on issues related to movement and migration for much of my practice, but deeply uh, beginning in 2011. Um, Crossings is the first of many large installations and a precursor to another project titled Leavings Belongings that I'll speak about later. Um, Crossings is a collaborative installation with my partner in crime, Minneapolis-based artist Harriet Bart. With our individual skill sets, we came together to present this work. The installation was part of a campus-wide event about walking. We walk for pleasure, for wandering and thinking, for exercise as community activity, to reach destinations, and in some circumstances, to survive. The installation consists of a six and a half minute uh, composite video that I created with filmed footage, stop motion drawings, sourced um, news images from current events, um, and it's projected at about 38 by 18 feet. This installation also comprises of six tons of river box. Many of these rocks were numbered, marking an individual in the scope of the unfathomable number of displaced persons. For instance, you see 290 of 60 million and 347 of 60 million. In 2015, it was impossible to avoid daily reports of the current global forced displacement of populations. In the United Nations High Commission on Refugees annual report, the number of people displaced at the end of 2014 had risen to a staggering 60 million. As of 2020, worldwide forced displacement had risen to 80 million. Crossings calls attention to this global crisis. Under boundless skies and beautiful landscapes are borders and fences. The number of rocks, the scrolling of numbers in the video underscores the staggering amount of refugees. Okay, let's move on to three projects in which community engagement is quite a part of each process. So in 2018, I received a grant from the Union of Concerned Scientists to do a public um, artwork about climate change. And I chose in particular to look at environmental displacement. 
This piece with and without water is an outdoor multi-channel video installation. The videos are projected onto the walls of tents, symbolic of temporary shelters. Beautiful. Displacement of people and communities linked to adverse effects of climate change is a current reality and expected to increase in the future. Let me just turn that down a little bit. The project addresses the urgency of action in adjusting to and slowing the effects of global warming while also revealing the consequences of displacement. We are complicit in causing a multitude of hazards for future generations, from rising waters to severe droughts. The installation is on a site where the state displaced hundreds of predominantly Chinese and Syrian immigrants' families to route a highway through their neighborhood in the 1960s. Working with residents and community organizations, words and images of Chinatown residents speaking about their immigration, about environmental concerns from their country of origin and their community here is an aspect of this installation. Boston's climate data projects rising waters will that adversely affect this marginalized community as early as 2030. And with and without water brings us and other environmental discussions to the forefront. On the day of the opening, I set up a climate table in which the public was invited to write their concerns about climate change, about the environment, and about proposed actions. They wrote their messages on a white flag, and these were posted around the tents. Here you also see um, video stills from five of the projections. Moving forward now, um, I like to talk about lantern stories. This is a recent project in Boston's Chinatown that was up from early September to late November in 2020. Uh, many of you um, may recognize this location. Um, I received this commission from the Greenway Conservancy to do a light-based project uh, in the summer of 2019. And this is, um, this was just the start. So throughout the fall and winter, I have been designing this work. I spoke to community members, businesses, and held several uh, listening sessions right before the pandemic descended and Boston went into lockdown. The content creation took place in the spring and during Black Lives Matter, and the, uh, during the Black Lives Matter movement. I wanted to address the anti-Asian sentiment that was escalating then and still is, as seen most recently in the horrific events of this week. Um, it was also important to acknowledge the ties the Asians had with the, Asian, uh, with the civil rights movement. One of the most important outcomes was the passing of the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965, which abolished a national quota system. It enabled my family to immigrate. Oops, sorry. Lantern Story celebrates Boston's Chinatown's vibrant community. I created 31 lanterns to illuminate Boston's history, culture, and resiliency. The images on the lanterns relate to the long and fraught history of Chinese immigration in the United States and celebrate Boston Chinatown's culture and community. It highlights the arts, calligraphy, music, performance, as well as the community's strong commitment to education, entrepreneurship, and social justice. These lanterns hold the experience and stories of communities past and present.
This project involved a process of intensive historical research and community engagement. And although I met uh, with many community members through listening sessions, one of the most rewarding outcomes was to hear stories shared with me on the day of the soft opening. Residents told me they appreciated their immigration story told through this public artwork. Although these images were selected based on historical context, it was wonderful to meet residents as they pointed out their home, their school, their grocer. And that's my brother, that's my mother-in-law, that's my neighbor. I have since gathered many more amazing stories and histories. From the drawing table to fabrication to installation, there's a blog that accompanies uh, this project. Um, this, the blog details images and stories of each lantern according to five categories, history, activism, entrepreneurship, life, and the arts, hosted on the Greenway website. Uh, I decided to add this uh, slide in response to the terrible events of this week and this entire year. These lanterns were created last year in response to the escalating anti-Asian sentiments. The indignity of being Asian in this country has been underreported. The poet and essayist Catherine uh, Park Hong writes in Minor Feelings, an Asian American Reckoning. Her essays explore the painful and often invisible racial traumas that Asian Americans experience, traumas that have been become impossible to ignore over the past year as reports of anti-Asian racism and violence has increased. As an immigrant and a daughter of Asian immigrants, the Asian American community for the most part instills in us to be quiet, to blend in. If we're nice enough, if we're quiet enough, you know, we'll be accepted and seen as American enough. Well, as evident from the terrible events uh, of violence this year, this is not true. From the, 1818, from the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act to recent events, Asians are still seen as the other, no matter how many generations your family has been here and has served this country. The model minority is a myth that is used as a weapon when politically convenient. It's been a challenge to speak to our elders and to those who are newer immigrants to encourage them to speak up and to get them to understand that speaking up and speaking out will help make a difference to themselves and to others. But I am really hopeful for the newer generations of Asian Americans. They are fiercer, more involved, and so much less afraid and prouder of being Asian American. A lot of Asian Americans are more vocal, they're organized, they're radicalized, and they're progressive. I created Lantern Stories with the hope that each lantern will initiate your curiosity, your desire to learn more about the history of Chinese immigration to the United States and the social and injustice issues throughout history and current times faced on multiple levels by Asian Americans. I hope it generates civic dialogue, education, and understanding among different communities. Let's move on now to the last project. Um, this is Leaving's Belongings. This is a durational project. Um, it was uh, originally conceived in 2017 with artist Harriet Bart after our exhibition, Crossings. Because of our geographic location, Harriet and I have developed this project in different iterations in our respective regions, in our respective communities, and on our own way. Sculptural installation has been shown in the ICA uh, Maine College of Art in Portland, in Boston at the Pow Arts Center and Hub Week 2019, and most recently at Site Santa Fe, New Mexico. I believe that human migration and climate change are two of the defining issues of the century. 
Within the global community, record num numbers of people are displaced as a result of armed conflict, human rights abuse, economic deprivation, and adverse effects of climate change. People continue to cross borders and to relocate in search of safety and a decent life. Leaving's belongings amplifies the voice of the individual immigrant and refugee who make it here to the United States. Participants create symbolic cloth wrap bundles while sharing stories about their own and their family's immigration journey. These bundles represent what's left behind, home, family, community, and possessions, and what can be carried in migration, survival, hope, and dreams. These bundles are the building blocks of the sculptural installations that tell their stories. Since late 2017, I've been working with immigrant and refugee organizations in Portland, Maine and Worcester, Mass. The following year, um, I was invited to be the 2018-2019 artist in residence um, at the Pow Arts Center, a new community center in Boston's Chinatown. Over a period of nine months, um, I met with over 150 community members and the larger public. Collected throughout my residency, this exhibition at the POW includes photographs, videos, and two site-specific sculptural installations of the bundles. Uh, here's a view of two iterations of the final pieces. You know, the story of one individual is powerful. But when multiplied and seen as an accumulation of voices, it's all the more powerful. In transformation from workshop to a sculptural piece, these bundles are installed in mass and the voices cannot be denied. Here's a, a view of the second sculptural form, recalling lines, lines of walking, lines to exit, lines for food, lines for a chance at a new life. Along the wall are portraits of many of the participants with their bundles. Here's a, a, a portrait wall. The red line that appears often in my work is uh, symbolic of the uh, uh, red of bloodlines and the red of borders. Well, this is the fun part. Through the act of making together, through the act of sharing narratives of their journey, participants begin to generate dialogue that bridge across experience, generations, ethnicity, and sometimes politics and religion. I held over 50 sessions and a dozen private interviews. These gatherings are as small as one person to as large as 10. Here you see examples held at the Pow Arts Center Southeast Asian Coalition in Worcester, Adelante, a Women's Collective in Santa Fe, and the Refugee Wellbeing uh, Organization in Albuquerque. The choice of fabrics comes from donations, as well as my search to find representative fabric patterns from areas of the world that has seen vast amounts of emigration and, um, and conflict. Uh, canvas tags are offered to the participants to the participants um, if they would like to write a narrative, a poem, a statement. There is complete freedom in selecting fabrics, tying, sewing, uh, in, uh, to make their individual bundles. Here's one participant's view of, on why she chose the fabric that she did. She says here that this, rep, uh, this um, represents the color of my culture. The red pattern reminds me of Chinese New Year and the future. Also, I am mixing it with dark and powerful colors. My parents favored these colors and patterns because they remind them of life back home. The colors and fabric I chose may look messy, but it has a powerful meaning for me and for my parents. And, is, and it's now carried into my heart. This is from uh, a young woman named Stephanie and she emigrated uh, with her family from China in, the, in 1990. Here's a, a closer view of the bundles with their tags. Um, 
Some of them, as you can see, are in English and others are in the participants' native language. Many of the stories shared in these sessions are stories of terrible fear and trauma, fleeing war and persecution, and environmental degradation such that they can no longer remain. But the many stories shared are also of gratitude, of hope and dreams for a better future here in the United States and for their children and for themselves. Um, I like to share two examples of what is written on tags. One is from a, a woman from Lebanon. She says here, my bundle will take the shape of a tear. It will be the color of white for the tears I have shed. It will also be tainted by the color of red for the blood I've escaped, the color black for the darkness I've endured and the color gray for the uncertainty I will face. And also, um, here's another one. Um, my, gran my grandfather emigrated from Portugal. One day when I was a child, he told me this story. In the old country, we were told that the roads in America were paved with gold. When I got here, I learned that the roads were not paved at all and that I was expected to pave them. I'd also like to share one more story. Um, I was fortunate to meet Paravash Rouhani in Portland, Maine, uh, who over the decade has become an activist bringing attention to the persecution of her, of her religious faith. I personally knew so little about the Islamic revolutions, uh, revolutionaries overthrowing the Shah of Iran in 1979. Members of the Baha'i faith once again faced persecution. She relates that on a single night in December, 500 Baha'i homes were burned to the ground. One belonged to Paravash's family. Um, she was 18 years old at the time preparing for college. And she writes that she escapes with the clothes on her back and her grandmother's necklace. Paravash says, my parents were very worried about what would happen to me in this new fanatical regime. They sent their only daughter then to India with two cousins. And when by 1982, the regime had yet to fall, uh, Paravash by then was married and became a refugee and stateless. A year later, 10 of her Baha'i friends were executed in, 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 in Iran. And um, I've come to be acquainted with her over the years. She's been outspoken about the per persecution of her people and she has made every attempt to pass on her culture and language to her children as best as she can. Here's another example, um, another experience about the shape of memory from one generation to the next and the struggles faced in different ways from both. It is familiar in so many of the children of immigrants that I spoke with. My identity nowadays feels very conflicted. I'm African American and I have always identified as such. However, I'm also Sanglinese, even though I have never been exposed to the culture. I still don't know my father's immigration story fully. He said we did not need to know his difficulties, that we are free, and he never integrated his culture into my life. I feel that I have missed being a part of my heritage. Um, here's another iteration of the project in 2019. Um, New American Economy and Open Avenues and Foundation invited me to participate um, in the Hub Week uh, of, of 2019. And the theme of that year was foreign born, Boston based and immigrant led. And this is a new, inter, uh, new iteration of Leaving's Belongings created with 500 New England bundles. Harriet joined me in this endeavor. So here we are, uh, Leaving's Belongings uh, at Site Santa Fe. Um, just as a correction, it is currently down. Um, it came down on January 24th, but it was up for an entire year since uh, it opened um, two days after the lockdown. That was, this, that was the um, planned opening. And, it, and since the, for, this one, for this full year, it's been um, opened and closed off and on. 
Um, this particular, uh, this version of Leaving's Belongings was part of a larger exhibition at Site Santa Fe titled Displaced, Contemporary Artists Confront the Global Refugee Crisis. And in this exhibition, bundles were brought together from Boston and Minneapolis with my collaborator, Harriet Bart, who made more than half of the 1,000 bundles. Most of my bundles were from those participating in the sessions that I held in Boston and so in the New England area. This exhibition, at this is Site Santa Fe. This exhibition is in two rooms. In the front room, you just saw the wall of portraits and a didactic about the work. And then you see the main sculptural installation suspended in a net. You see here the second room. And here the video Tell Me is a single channel projection. The second sculpture is titled Cascade. And rows of mirrors are hung at different eye levels. You can see the reflection of yourself and you see the video behind you telling an immigrant's story. And here's a fun time lapse of the in installation of um, at the making of Suspended. So um, let's end with an excerpt from the video, Tell Me. The music score is by Boston Des Moines composer, Bo Kenyon. Um, I went through many, many hours of interviews to select the narrative and voices uh, in context to this piece. I also invited certain participants to read their tags in their native language. Um, we then layer the recordings of these voices. I feel really honored to be the keeper of these stories and to be able to put together this video. And um, I just want to tell, say that this is a 16 minute video and um, I will stop it um, around five minutes. And I hope that you will uh, have a chance to see it yourself. I was a bird does not need a place to call the country. But we shall always try to cook the bread and I can cross fences and break walls and borders. I can fly over deserts and mountains and rivers and the crows and across oceans. Where is home when there is no home left? And there is no place in the country. It's just a ghostly memory. I cannot call it home. He asked me, I wish. Once you heard the you must the name I am I have only two I have to run. I can take two hours. I can I 
kept very still in the sorghum field. I was glad we had not yet begun the harvest. But then I heard they would like the house, and then the field. Where should I run? Where is my family? Um, I'm grateful for my dual. I wish I was a bird. Does that mean a blade?我租了的包袱就在这个时候被丢到了海底我告诉我在战争的时期他带着三个小孩子住在自己的娘家空军进城了他带着孩子们躲在长江上游运棉花的小船逃跑家里给他打了一个布包袋子里面全是金银玉都
I think I'm hoping that the the work reflects what's what's currently ha occurring, and that it mirrors all the different issues and concerns uh, in the crises that's that's happening in this world. You know the the um, subject matter is so complex, and your work is so complex. It's hard to imagine, you know, the, the amount of um, effort and energy to pull all of this together. How do you how do you start? Do you start with the seed of an idea? How do you how do you begin one of these projects? I mean, it depends on the project. And because it's so multi-layered, uh, most of these projects take a long time. Right. And, um, you know, I wouldn't have been able to make the video tell me in 2018, but I was able to do it in 2020 after one year of really speaking to so many different people. Um, I stay up a, a, up a lot <laughs> late at night thinking about all the different things I, I want to do that I can't do that I would love to do, you know? So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an evolving situation. It's an evolving project, yeah, process. Well, it seems to involve a lot of research, not only um, into the, the subject matter, but to finding collaborators and the, the variety of materials and methods that you use to uh, create your work. Um, it's, it's just uh, quite impressive, I think. Okay. Um, the so, research and development is really important. And, and the, the forming of the idea, the, the forming of the methodologies, these are all, uh, they all need time kind of to be more or less in place before the project actually begins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, we don't have a, a whole lot of time, but I'm wondering if uh, other people might have some questions. And Jean, if you open the chat, I can see, um, you know, if we if we can uh, ask a few questions. Um, the chat is open. And I see there's a question from Joel Angelillo. Yeah. So Joel, Joel is asking, have you ever received pushback or negative re response from the public um, uh, for your installations, for your public installations? And if so, how do you handle that? Um, yeah. For the most part, people who do not respond to the installations will not tell me so. They've been very respectful. But, but uh, on the other hand, I've had very constructive discussions. And I think that's great. It's the start of conversations. It's the start of um, different, uh, talking about differences and, uh, you know, working that through together. So do you, you, when you are in, um let's say with, with the lanterns. I, I was down in Chinatown and I saw them um, myself. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder if you spend some time um, in the areas where you, you make uh, work to just have, it, have an opportunity to engage with people as they're experiencing it. Um, well, in the very beginning, in 2019, when I was just starting to think about what this project would look like, um, I spent a lot of time there. I sat on the site, I watched um, how the traffic flowed, how people used this space, and um, it really started to gel that it needed to be um, suspended, and it also needed to be, I think the community wanted a conversation about their immigration stories. And that started to become very, it just kind of all came together, of course, during the pandemic. It was very obvious that this was the course um, that I had to take for this project. Mm -hmm. And then when the lanterns were up, I did spend time there. It was really fun to watch people, to meet with people, to get feedback, um, both from residents to you know, general public and running into people that I know, it was, um, it was very rewarding. 
So Nan, uh, Nan is asking, um, she said, I've heard you will be doing another lantern project in San Francisco. And how might that difference differ from your Boston Chinatown project apart from different stories? Well, um, San Francisco's uh, installation will be on Grand Ave. It's, um, it's a very long avenue for anybody that has been there. So it will have a different uh, iteration, but also uh, each of the lanterns will tell a different story. So uh, other than, well, of course there's the general history of Chinese immigration, uh, and, but specifically it will tell the story of San Francisco's um, Chinese uh, community. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, inclusively, I also want to really cover um, the Asian uh, American population in general. Will some of the lanterns from Boston go to San Francisco? At this time, no. no. I'm, I'm crossing my fingers, but hopefully it will be reinstalled um, this year at mm -hmm. Park again. Oh, the Boston. Yeah. Oh, great. great. We'll see what the funding looks like. <laughs> Okay, so Audrey's asking, do you have ideas about how to best design actionable plans to make change for the communities um, you, you've worked with? Do you know of organizations that are best positioned to put those plans in place? So do you take, do you take this a step further into activism? You know, I, I'm not an activist in that way. I think um, I leave that to those who are able to best organize these um, this pro the, um, these these uh, to organize these. And for me, I feel like my art is activism. What I can do, yeah, and quiet kind of activism. It's just a different way. Yeah. And and it this is my medium. This is my language. This is what I can do. Um, so. Yeah, I, I hope that generates um, and uh, others to want to take action in their own way. And uh, whether it's, you know, through education, whether it's through organizing. Um, in the case of Chinatown, um, there's quite a few organizations that currently exist to support this, uh, the marginalized community. So, so you see your work as a catalyst, perhaps. Yes. A catalyst, yeah. Um, okay, so Rosie's asking, the depth and intimacy of your work is mesmerizing. And I wonder um, that it isn't emotionally draining. How do you take care of yourself as you're exposed to so many of these stories? Um, there are many sleepless nights. <laughs> There are many times when I have to say to myself, I really have to separate myself from uh, the person telling me the stories. Um, you just have to compartmentalize, put it aside. I step back. I think of myself as the, um, the observer of this so that I'm not absorbing all that emotion in me. But it doesn't mean that I don't. I mean, there are times when I can't even work and um, it's very hard. So, but I think the stories need to be told and I'm doing my best. <laughs> so we uh, have a question from Cecily who says, how do you get to, how do you get or solicit volunteers to participate in your collaborative art? I think it's really helpful to have organizations. Um, to work through organizations. So, uh, in, in, for instance, at the Pow Art Center, I work through um, uh, the Boston Chinatown Neighborhood Centers. Um, there are uh, the ACDC, which is the uh, Asian um, Development Centers. Um, and in Portland, it was with economic uh, opportunities there uh, through uh, the, the, the city of Portland. So, and also in South, uh, the Southeast Asian Coalition in Worcester. So, you know, you, you really need to collaborate uh, with these people that know the community, because I don't. And it takes a, lo a long time to know a community. So if you think about it, I've done three projects now in Chinatown over the course of 
what, three or four years. And, I, and I'm still learning. So you're reaching out to organizations who are sort of the middle person between you and your eventual collaborator. Yeah, and then as you as you get to know more of the community, you can reach out to to residents yourself mm -hmm. or to community members. Well, yourself. you're making your you're making your own connections then, mm -hmm. and then you yeah. start. Yes. Yeah. So we have one more question uh, from Rick, who says, "Who are some artists that inspire you?" Oh gosh, that's hard. Um, you know, I, I think there's so many ins inspirations from writers to musicians, um, to visual artists. Um, off the top of my head right now, I'm thinking of Hank Willis Thomas, um, you know, for, and, and uh, but I've also had formal list, um, uh, you know, inspirations from, you know, people like uh, Martin Purrier. And uh, so it, it goes a wide spectrum. Right. Uh, 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 someone like uh, Doris Salcedo. And Doris Salcedo, of course. Yeah, yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah. And writers like um, uh, Valeria Luiselli. Luis um, so she, she's been uh, really instrumental in helping me think about how stories are told. I, I don't know if you know her. She is, she's. Um, I I don't know her. Yeah, she she actually the 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 title of my video tell me is from her book, Tell oh. Me How It Ends. Mm -hmm. And um, she was a translator. Um, she uh, she translated for uh, the children at the border, uh, uh, the Mexican children that were coming in. So she mm -hmm. was a, she gathered so many stories. Yeah. Well, I, uh, oh, here, here's one more question uh, from Patricia. Speaking of creating bridges, how does the non-immigrant community react to your work? Are they able to find themselves in the experiences you explore and document? Um, I, I, I hope that it does something for all people, <laughs> you know? Um, I, I hope that it generates a sense of wanting to know more about the other and wanting to reach out and experience um, the stories of others and, and hopefully to create civic dialogue uh, amongst all of us. So I, I think in some ways, when you ask me what's the responsibility of the artist, I think it's also the responsibility of the viewer and for everyone. Exactly, exactly. Well, I think this has been a wonderful first um, evening of this series. Uh, I'm so delighted to have been asked to facilitate and have a conversation with you, uh, Yuen, and um, I'm going to just turn it back over to Jean so she can say goodbye. And thank you all for being here. It was really lovely to have such a nice uh, group of people. Thank you, Linda, and thank you, Yuen, um, and thank you to our audience. I can just echo Linda's comments. We really appreciate you being here. Yuen, thank you so much for sharing your stories um, and the, sto the your stories about collecting the stories of the people that you've met. Um, I'd like to invite you all to join us for our April 15th speaker, the second person that's talking in our series, Rosa Rodriguez-Williams from the MFA, she's the Senior Director of Belonging and Inclusion. She'll be speaking about the audience perspective. And then on May 20th, we have Barbara Alphon speaking from the collector's perspective, specifically about the Alphon Collection of Contemporary Art at Rollins College. Thank you. Thank you.